Lawmakers questioning will likely focus on the central bank's handling of inflation uh, and its plans to raise bank capital requirements. Joining us right now to get into it is the Bonson Group Chief Investment Officer, founding and managing partner, David Bonson. He's also the author of a new book, which we've all been talking about, Full Time, Work and the Meaning of Life. David, great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Good to be with you. Got it. To talk about your new book in a second, but first, what are you expecting from Jay Powell today? Well, I think they'll do the kind of normal talking points about the fact that they are holding steady and they're not necessarily going to cut yet, but they're willing to cut. Um, I don't think it's going to be anything earth shattering. What I'd like him to talk about is the preposterous announcement yesterday from the Biden administration about capping credit card late fees. These are the fiscal and monetary things that the Biden administration is focusing on is an eight dollar credit card fee. And I wish the Fed would tell Congress this is a real low priority. I'm so glad you mentioned this because we have so many serious priorities. A woman is dead because she was murdered by an illegal migrant in Georgia. And now we're talking about late fees. I mean, we're talking about an economy that perhaps is slowing down to the extent of recession later on this year. We're waiting on the February ADP numbers any moment. David, it's going to be out in about two minutes. The expectations call for jobs, uh, creation of 150,000 private sector jobs to have been added to the economy in the month of February. Then we'll get the January jolts number out at 10 a.m. Eastern this morning. And of course, we'll get the uh, Labor Department's uh, February jobs report on Friday. What are your expectations? I don't want to, you don't have to go too far into it. The number's out in one and a half minutes. But what would you, how would you assess jobs so far? I mean, I think the bigger issue is whether or not the ADP number and the number Friday from BLS again contradict each other. That's been happening quite a bit lately. The JOLTS number I care about because I want people to go get jobs. And the BLS is measuring people that want a job that have one. The JOLTS is indicating that there's a lot of people apparently don't want a job. These unfilled positions, the low labor participation force. That, to me, is the bigger issue. And that is an issue that you cover in the book, which is really important. So we'll get to that. Are you surprised that the economy is not weaker, David, given 11 rate hikes? Uh, I am not surprised. I think that the Fed has known very well that the bulk of what would be affected by rate hikes has not been affected. Most homeowners had locked mortgages. They froze the housing market. But it isn't like there's a ton of people paying 7 or 8 percent. They're just not buying. That's a great point. Exactly Most people Steve are paying 3 percent. Yeah. That yeah. is exactly what Steve Schwartzman told me last and, night. And corporate borrowing is the same thing, which Blackstone, Steve Schwartzman knows very well. Companies have a maturity wall next year. Let's get to the February ADP number. It's 140,000 jobs created as the number, David, a little less than expected. Markets that uh, picked up a little bit on that number were pretty stable as where we were. Your reaction? Yeah, I don't think the ADP number normally does move uh, stock market futures. What I think is going to happen is on Friday, you're going to get indication of hourly wages, of labor participation. And then, like uh, she talked about, revisions. You remember last num- last month, it wasn't just the big headline number. Revisions were up from prior months, yeah. which we haven't seen a lot of lately. By the way, the revisions here, we got a revision of January up 111,000 for the uh, ADP January number. Let's talk about your book and how you're connecting the dots of jobs to younger generations. The book is full-time working and the meaning of life. Tell me this. Tell us about it. Yeah, I basically am making the argument that we have to recover the passion for work that made America great. I think this is deeply rooted in my own Christian faith, but our country was uh, built around this idea that work is not just something you do because you have to. I believe that. If a man doesn't work, he won't eat, things like that. But I also believe it's soul fulfilling, that we produce goods and services that meet the needs of humanity. People today have a negative attitude of work. Let's do the least amount we can so we can get to the weekend, so we can get to yoga class at four o'clock or whatever it is people do. I think people should celebrate a very passionate view of work. And I think the idea that we work so we won't have to do it anymore, this kind of retirement ethos, has really bled down to younger generations. It's having a negative impact in the culture. Well, one of the, I mean, it's not just your Christian faith. I'm making an assumption here. It's if you're around the age that I am, your parents lived through the depression. Yeah. And you're, isn't that all right. of our cases? Our parents yeah. lived through the depression and they were saving everything and they were telling us and instilling in us work hard. That's the way you get to hear. Yeah. Is that still and, the case for younger generations? Well, and, and that's the question, right? I mean, I'm so glad you wrote this book because more people need to make the moral case for work and the moral case for capitalism. So yeah. thank you for doing that. Do you notice a difference in the generations, to Maria's point? Yeah. The mm-hmm. boomers, the millennials, Gen X, Gen Z? 
I do. It's a huge difference. And I think the boomers produced more goods and services than any generation in history, hardest working generation ever. But they were the first generation that entered the workforce with an eye on retirement. And and so I think that then you look at Gen X. I turn 50 next month, right in the middle of Gen X. Um, they have this existential crisis as to whether or not the work matter or doesn't mean anything. What should I do with the second half of my life? I want people to do with the second half of their life what they did with the first half of their life, because that's probably what they're best at, what their most experience and, and expertise is. Um, it's the Gen Z, the younger generation. I'm obviously skipping millennials here for time. They will care about mission. They care about accomplishing something. I want them, to your point about capitalism, the moral defense of free enterprise, quit saying, I want to work for this business as long as they're doing something for social cause, social justice. Your business is a social cause. It's producing goods and services that meet the needs of humanity. Nobody will buy the product if it isn't doing something for somebody. We need to explain to the younger generation that there's great mission in business. But, but did it start at home for you, though? Am I right about that? I mean, maybe you did not have parents who grew up during the Depression. I, I did, and my mom would save everything, and that's how she instilled that in me. Is that... Yeah, I mean, my, my, my dad was the hardest working person I ever knew. The book's dedicated to him. He died in his 40s, and he was a pastor and, and Christian intellectual. So he wasn't in the business world, but he still worked 18 hours a day and taught me to. So that is definitely where it came from. And then my grandparents that were right in the Depression, they were yeah. you know, a huge part of my life. I agree completely. Yeah, it starts at home. David, yeah. thank you. Thanks, David Bonson joining us.